Wholesale Change is brought to you by Epicor. For nearly 50 years, Epicor has helped distributors stay ahead with flexible, powerful solutions designed to increase sales, streamline operations, and improve customer experience. Epicor's industry-leading distribution ERP solutions are built specifically to meet the unique needs of wholesalers with everything needed to grow your sales, profits, and productivity while distancing yourself from the competition. Epicor is focused on the things that matter to you, work queues, PO variances, queues, kitting assembly and production orders, advanced inventory forecasting, VMI, and special project pricing. They build their software using industry best practices and 50 years of distribution experience. But Epicor solutions are far more than just tools for pick, pack, and ship. Fully cloud-based with a modern UI, Epicor offers complete, robust e-commerce solutions, powerful BI, and analytics tools, modern API and EDI, value-added services, WMS, virtual assistants, and much more. You can learn how Epicor helps thousands of wholesalers by visiting epicor.com. Okay, so we've got a, a really packed agenda here today on quarterly updates from four different distributors. And we're, we're gonna shift to, uh, to, um, to Beacon. Um, so let me share a little bit about Beacon. Uh, many of you may know who, who Beacon is. They are the largest publicly traded distributor of roofing materials. And um, they've got revenues of, at least in the trailing 12 months, of over $7 billion. Um, they sell complementary building products, including siding, insulation, waterproofing, uh, tools and equipment, as well as solar. So they've they've branched out from kind of their core business, which was roofing materials, and they've expanded into the complementary building products. A um, few things on Beacon. So first of all, they are a house of brands. And what I mean by this is uh, there is the Beacon brand itself, but most of the people who buy from Beacon are buying from a, a regional or perhaps a super regional brand. So over the years, they've acquired literally dozens of regional brands. They manage that across um, four to 500 locations in North America uh, with over 6,000 employees, a significant fleet, and then a large uh, assortment of building materials products. A couple of things about Beacon. Um, in the in the trailing 12 months, or in the trailing 15 months now at this point, um, they they had a suffered a minor hit, or, or actually pretty decent hit on um, what would have been the second quarter of 2020 due to COVID. Now, historically, as a business, their their business slows down in the first quarter of the annual year. Right, the, the building materials industry construction slows down significantly. So when they say we recorded second quarter net sales and adjusted EBITDA. Um, what that means is pretty much they had a near break even number for um, net income and a and the largest operating income that, that they've had in the sec in that second quarter of theirs, which ends up being the first quarter of the calendar year. So they had twenty two million eight hundred thousand dollars operating income in that in that second quarter of theirs, whereas historically they lose $100 million to $200 million in that quarter because of the slowdown. And then they make up their revenues in the rest of the quarters. Um, things that were driving their second quarter net sales, record second quarter net sales were, the, there's a big uptick in residential. Um, they've gotten the gross margins uh, up it's been a 270 basis point improvement over the last 12 months. So they're up in the 25 plus percent range of, of gross margins. Historically, as a business, their profitability, the net income has been in the, the one to two percent range. So um, they're a little bit down from that normal um, net income that they, that they typically deliver. Um, but their, their market cap has come up nicely since the, the, era, the beginning of COVID, right? Uh, you can see the market cap has more than trebled 
in that time frame. So they're, they're executing well. And here are some of the things that, that they are focusing on as a business. The first is really creating bid support for contractors. Bid support, uh, including estimation, um, bidding, moving in and out products, specified products, as well as job support, managing hours and things like that. So they're, they're trying to get deeper into their customers' uh, business by providing these enhanced offerings. Uh, they've, they've done a significant partnership with a company that has a, a, a software solution to support this. Um, they're also doing things for helping people do estimation of roofing things, roofing um, projects. So somebody can, can look at a house and they can show up with a CAD-based version of the roofing design. I've experienced a similar thing like this when I had solar put in my house. When the salesperson showed up to my house, they had they actually already had a CAD design because they'd done an aerial of my roof. They showed up with where the solar panels would fit. Um, and we were able to have a discussion from there. So, so Beacon is doing a similar thing with the CAD tools that they are offering. Um, they are, as we mentioned, the largest publicly traded distributor of roofing materials. And they're actually one of the largest distributors of building materials in the US. Um, they have a competitor, SRS Distribution, who has a similar model of acquiring regional companies uh, integrating back office, uh, leaving the brands in the market and, and rolling from there. So I'll take a breath. Um, Ian, anything that you wanted to add about Beacon um, based on your knowledge of them and from your time at Whitecap? Yeah, I just want to make sure you can hear me okay, Jonathan. You bet. Let's go. Yeah, so I think, you know, this is a this is an area that should be booming right now. You know, I know in Home Depot's latest report, they said that the housing inventory is at post-World War II levels. So there's a two-month availability of supply versus a historic six-month availability of supply. So I think, you know, Beacon, like some of these other construction distributors, is really well positioned to grow for a long time because, you know, even when the economy slows down, it's going to take a long time before the housing stock increases again. So whereas this is traditionally a cyclical business, all of these distributors are really looking at years of good growth, I think. Um, it is sort of pent, pent up demand from COVID as well as the, even, the cycle that it was on anyhow? Yeah, I mean, it was already growing. And then, you know, a lot of people didn't move during COVID for obvious reasons. So I do think there is an opportunity for these companies to grow dramatically for a while. Good. Um, should we move to uh, Home Depot at this point? Yeah, let's do Home Depot and Fasten All. So for people who join late, I'm in camping in the boonies in Arkansas. So my <clears throat> apologies if, uh, if uh, I don't come through as clearly as normal and you don't get to see my charming face. Um, so Home Depot saw just unbelievable growth in the first quarter. You know, they had like 31% uh, comps. Um, they had... Uh, uh, you know, fan fantastic earnings. Um, they had, uh, you know, I guess, thirty-two point seven percent growth. Actually, they said that the pro side of the business actually outgrew the DIY set set side of the business. The earnings were up nearly eighty-six percent. Um, digital sales were twenty-seven percent of their total. More than half of that was fulfilled through their stores. Uh, inventory turns were up from five to five and a half percent. Their uh, they're increasing their fulfillment square footage by 70% this year, including a new type of facility that I've not heard of before called an FDC or flatbed uh, distribution center. And there they're going to, in their language, they're going to fulfill everything from, you know, bags of concrete to, you know, drywall to roofing products, et cetera. Um, so they are really on a roll. Now, of course, they bought HD Supply, transaction that closed uh, a few months ago and uh, you know they don't really report that as a separate business on a, as a line item they really break it out to diy versus pros um but you know they're they're investing 
$1.2 billion to build 150 new facilities to reach 90% of the U.S. population the same day or next day. And that's business and households. So it's really just as impressive as could be. And they said their CSAT score uh, was up 11 points or 11 percent. Yeah, 11 points. So I'm not sure how that, you know, what, what the starting point was on that. But, you know, this has become just this gigantic B2B seller. You know, we think that, you know, they're probably – what would the math work out to be a $65 billion distributor? If you assume that about, you know, 47% of their sales are going to pros of all kinds, but that does include contractors, but it also includes, you know, multifamily and all these other B2B segments they're selling to uh, and they're, and they're servicing them as MRO customers. So, you know, I think if you're in the construction supplies distribution trades, so electrical, plumbing, um, concrete construction, et cetera, then your real concern in terms of disruptors is not Amazon business, who's not doing flatbed delivery and managing projects and doing tool rentals. Your concern is the Home Depot and the kind of growth that we are seeing out of the Home Depot is unmatched by any distributor that I know of. Do you know of anybody who's grown at this kind of rate, Jonathan? Um, I mean, unless we talk about Amazon, but in, ter in terms of traditional distributors, no. Um, and then to your point, you know, th their balance sheet puts them in a position to do additional acquisitions if they want to, right? Um, I, don't know, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what their propensity is to ingest another significant acquisition like an HD supply, uh, but they certainly have the balance sheet to do that. And we've switched. Well, we, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ian. Well, see, HD Supply would have been a significant acquisition in terms of the size of the business for most other companies. And in when Home Depot acquired HD Supply, I don't even think they adjusted their earnings expectations because it was too small to be accretive or not. Um, so, I, you know, my guess is with the scale of that company, they could go out and buy just about anybody they want. And, uh, you know, so whether or not they do, we'll see. But that whole B2B side of the house for the Home Depot, I mean, it comes out in discussions on the earnings calls. They have it in their investor presentations. It's clearly a focus. And, you know, they're a, just an enormous threat to traditional distributors selling into the construction market, whatever it is that you sell. Well, and, and I think building on that, Ian, we've spoken to CEOs in the mechanical, electrical, plumbing sectors recently who say that Home Depot is the company that keeps them up at night. So, right. um, you know, so perhaps um, it, it's a worthy question is, does Home Depot consider one of those an adjacent segment that it wants to move into? And if so, which would it be most likely to do? Would it be most likely to do plumbing, HVAC or electrical? I'm curious if you have a thought on that. Well, I think they're already pretty firmly in plumbing and electrical, less so in HVAC. Uh, I would think that the, that I would say that the expansion that you're likely to see in Home Depot, in my opinion, is to take categories, categories where they're already strong in residential and multifamily and you know, maybe industrialize them to some degree. So, you know, if you're already selling electrical to, you know, for residential contractors, well, most of those contractors or many of them also have a commercial side. So why not add those products? Or, you know, if you're in plumbing on, resident, on residential products, why not move into commercial or industrial? I think that's more likely than them getting into something like power transmission. What do you think? Uh, I definitely agree on the power transmission. Um, I'm just thinking like if they were to if they were to look at an acquisition of a one to five billion dollar distributor in the mechanical, electrical, plumbing space. That that's really where the question was going. Um, and you know, yeah, so got it. Yeah. So um, their model seems to be sell out of our stores or sell out of distribution centers, mm -hmm. right? I, so my sense, and of course, you know, these kinds of predictions are always dangerous because it's so easy to be wrong. My guess is that one of the reasons that HD Supply was so attractive is that wasn't that that facilities maintenance portion of HD Supply was not a branch-based business. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you look back, 
when when HD Supply, you know, a year ago or a year and a half ago, HD Supply was down to two divisions. They had White Cap, which was construction supplies, and they had facilities maintenance, which was MRO. Mm-hmm. Now, arguably, White Cap was a better fit in terms of the products, right? Because there was already a lot of overlap. The Home Depot carried a lot of that stuff. They already had contractors coming into their stores. But the difference was that YCAB had a fleet of branches, right? At the time, like 150 locations, a lot more now since they've made their own acquisitions. Um, but instead, they went the other direction and they bought FM. And I think in retrospect that the reason that FM was more attractive was FM was a distribution center-based business. They didn't have a fleet of branches. And so, you know, they could roll that into their distribution center network and they already know how to run those kinds of facilities. They didn't have to run a whole different type of fleet of retail style stores, which is what distributor branches are. Um, So, you know, on the HVAC side, you know, there aren't that HVAC is sort of inherently local because there's so much service work attached to it. Um, uh, And I think most of really electrical distributors are the same way. Um, So I, if, if they hold true to form, I would guess that they are more likely to acquire a DC and call center based distributor going forward than they are somebody who's got a fleet of branches. Now, having said that, they'll probably buy, you know, Granger tomorrow and prove me wrong. <laughs> but that's not what it looks like is likely to me right now. Fair enough. Other thoughts on Home Depot? Well, they're a juggernaut. I mean, you know, the, they, they not only grew at that ferocious rate, but they did it by, you know, improving their inventory turns a full half turn, which is just, you know, it's amazing. I mean, these guys are operators, right? They know how to run um, uh, a distribution company slash retailer. I think uh, if I was, you know, running a construction oriented distribution company right now, I would be picking apart these earnings calls and looking at these earnings presentations and, you know, they show up at these conferences and they're pretty transparent about what they're going to do, which has always been the history of Home Depot. You know, they're kind of like, you know, you know, here's a chip on my shoulder, knock it off if you can. Um, But they're also a good place to work and they win a lot of awards for that. Um, And they're going to, they're going to keep coming. And I think their focus on pros has traditionally really been around, you know, residential remodeling. Uh, first, residential building second, you know, and then they started, then they bought interline brands. I started building out these other uh, MRO categories. And, you know, this is, this is an industry with really two leading players, obviously, the Home Depot and Lowe's with Menards, really a, a relatively distant third. Well, guess what? Lowe's also saw massive growth in the first quarter, and they also grew their pro business by 20%. They have a, you know, relatively new energetic CEO who seems to be interested in closing some gaps between Lowe's and the Home Depot. Well, obviously he is. It's his job. Um, And I think you're going to see not only pressure from the Home Depot, but also from Lowe's continue because companies like this tend to mimic each other's moves not because they're weak strategic planners but because they all see the same things when they do the strategic planning and so what one sees as an opportunity the other is seeing at the same time yeah no no to our listeners we will be covering lows in a future quarterly uh update uh, like what we're doing here today for for all the reasons that ian mentioned they they are absolutely a a juggernaut as well Okay, we've uh, spoken before about Fastenal, um, kind of the darling of the market in many ways for the traditional distributors. Take it away, Ian. Well, you know, Fastenal has always been kind of the darling of distribution in terms of their performance, right? They were, you know, the fastest growing, they had great margins, um, and, and it's still a really good story, I and mean, I'm not trying to minimize it, but when you look at Fastenal's performance versus Home Depot, I mean, one of these things is not like the other one, right? And so I, I really, you know, they, they had, they grew at one-tenth the rate roughly, right? So, well, a little bit more than that, 3.7%, 5.3 on a daily basis. So maybe I'm overstating a little bit. Uh, gross margins were actually down 
pretty significantly. I think that's mostly mixed, though, around COVID products. Um, operating income performance, you know, it was roughly flat. They showed it up. You know, if you if you do the rounding, they're actually down a tenth, uh, uh, you know, ten basis points. Um, net earnings were up on a percentage basis, a little higher than the net sales growth, but a little less, actually somewhat less on a on a daily basis. Um, you know, their on-site location sales, they didn't give a specific number, which usually, you know, they said mid to high single digits. A lot of times that's because they don't, you know, they have some reason they don't want to disclose the exact number, not they fast and all, but just generally speaking. Um, and e-commerce sales were up 30, 35.5% and are now equal 12.2% of sales. And so, you know, my takeaway from this, Jonathan, is, Look, we all know, and we've been saying it for a long time, and a lot of other people have as well, that e-commerce is really necessary, but it's not a solution to a bigger strategic problem. And so for Fastenal, you know, they're still in a very, very appealing company. It's a very well-managed company. Their market cap is huge, right, for the, for the compared to other distributors. Um, and But despite the fact that their e-commerce sales are growing at an enormous rate, you know, it's not offsetting whatever strategic problems are preventing them from growing at the same rate as Home Depot. Now, to be fair, Fastenal has a huge amount of industrial business that has been relatively depressed compared to the Home Depot, which is, you know, strictly in the, you know, commercial MRO and construction markets. But, you know, the, the, there is just sort of this story in distribution where the disruptors are growing at unbelievable rates of growth, at, at unbelievable rates, and distributors are not, not even the darlings of distribution like fast and all. And so clearly there's some substantial channel shift out of pure B2B players and into uh either a disruptor like Amazon Business, which had an you know astronomical quarter again, uh, and a business like the Home Depot or Lowe's, which are you know growing in B two B at twenty thirty percent. So I, I just feel like you know the warnings that we've given about how hey this industry is under disruption and new players are moving in, it's really being borne out in this quarter's results. I mean, what's your impression? I think that's an absolutely fair take, uh, and we'd be curious to see as we get further and further from the beginning of COVID, um, whether the growth rates start to shift upward for the traditional distributors, there may still be some lag effect of COVID. Um, so as we get further from that, I'd be curious to see where it goes. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair, but you know, I think, um, you know, the, the, these are well-operated companies. I mean, Fastenal is a great operator. They always have been, they're very customer focused. They're very employee focused. Um, and I'm not by any means predicting trouble ahead for fast and all. I mean, they'll probably continue to, you know, grow and at, at great rates. My guess is that a lot of the channel share or channel shift that these disruptors are taking, they're getting from weaker players than the, you know, fast and alls and grangers of the world. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this would say, okay, you know, distributors don't create demand and neither do retailers. They serve demand, right? It's not like a manufacturer where you create or a software developer where you create this breakthrough product and suddenly you create a market that didn't exist before. Distributors and retailers serve existing demand. And so when a company like, you know, the Home Depot or Amazon Business comes in and starts taking tens of billions of dollars, that's coming out of demand that would have gone to other players. And so to me, this portends an increasing level of merger and acquisition activity um, in the wholesale distribution space, because, you know, there, there are players who are losing share now. Um, and some of those owners are going to want to sell before that gets to be too noticeable in their financial trends. Absolutely. And then the question is, what kind of what kind of valuation can they generate uh, based on where they are in the market? Um, so it's, it's, it's like a game of musical chairs, right? There's, there's not going to be enough chairs for everybody. There's going to be inherent, inherent consolidation. Um, so who's going to get consolidated and at what price? 
You know, I think you mentioned something important, Jonathan, which is, you know, the this pandemic was really, it, it, it changed a lot of trends, right? Like, you know, it was funny because on the Home Depot earnings call, someone said, hey, uh, what happened to the paint category? Because paint was like the only category that wasn't up 20%. And the answer was, well, we think everybody was home painting last year. And so we had unbelievably tough comps in that category, right? So there was there was a lot of behavior that was specific to 2020 that we're sort of tailing off of now that may have driven different performances by category like paint or like uh, safety supplies because everybody was selling hand sanitizer and masks and all that stuff. And I think this stuff needs to normalize for a couple of quarters before we really understand the trends. Um, and, uh, but, you know, certainly uh, right now, it looks like this disruption, if anything, is gaining speed. Good. Let's talk about a, a sector, another another company in a, in a different sector where there is a lot of disruption inherently from uh, the manufacturers. So, Ian, I know you've been a, a big fan of CDW for a long time. Um, they Their tagline is, or their slogan is, the people who get it. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you think that slogan means based on you having followed CDW for a while. Well, I like CDW a lot as a company. I think uh, they often get compared or, you know, analysts often clump them in with categories that include, you know, Cisco and Apple and other companies who are really manufacturers and they, you know, say, well, their margins aren't nearly as high and that kind of thing, which I think really misses the point that distributors, generally speaking, uh, they just can't build the kinds of gross margins that, a lot of manufacturers have, but they also don't have the R&D expense and a lot of other expenses. So I think that CDW has been obsessed with customer service for a long time and not just like being nice to customers or being good about managing their orders and uh, outstanding at fulfillment and all the traditional distributor stuff. They also are really, really good at putting highly technically capable people in front of their customers. They, you know, they, they, they have 10,000 employees and 7,000 that are customer facing and 3,200 of them are technically trained according to them. Um, and that's really valuable. I mean, they, they talk about how they're an extension of their customers, it teams um, with a strong knowledge of their businesses and deep capabilities so I think that those strengths are durable. I think that um, CDW is well positioned to grow for a while. I think they are subject to some specific issues of the day, like semiconductor shortages, right? So, you know, 80% of CDW sales come from hardware, which is no surprise, really. The rest is software and services. Well, right now, there's a hardware shortage across all kinds of industries because of the semiconductor shortage. You know, the the you know, if you talk to the guys at ITR Economics, Alex, Alex Chalsovsky, he says, well, look, what happened was in the second quarter of 2020, a lot of the industrial manufacturers predicted this huge fall off in demand. So they canceled all the semiconductor orders. So all the semiconductor uh, fabs backed way down on their production plans. Well, that shortage never materialized. So suddenly you had this big industrial return of demand, including a lot of pent-up demand. But at the same time, you had a huge increase in the demand for consumer products because all these people started working from home and they needed monitors and laptops and routers and all that stuff. And so you had sort of this double hit on the semiconductor fabs, and that's going to last for a while. Okay, well, if you're in the business of selling computer hardware, that's going to that's gonna hit you, right? I think another open issue is the degree to which the move to the cloud uh, will affect companies like CDW. I mean, they service those centers, but one of the effects of the cloud is a lot of individual companies don't have their own servers. Um, they need less networking infrastructure, uh, but there's also work from home, which is driving demand for other products. So I think some of that stuff is really hard to figure out. I think in the short term, CDW could be hit by the semiconductor shortage. But I think that's that's kind of like a one-time hit on earnings that you see, right? And it's like, well, you shouldn't factor that in too strongly because that's clearly a, a temporary problem. Um, they're so so here's yeah, they're really go ahead, go ahead. So, so so I mean, here's here's part of how, part of how I see CDW. If you look at the traditional 
tech manufacturer to distributor to value-added reseller to business customer channel, CDW is a little bit collapsing the middle two parts, the, the middle two parts of that channel, the, the distributor and the value-added reseller. In fact, you pointed out to me that some analysts have called them a value-added reseller. Um, I would say they are a I would say they are a distributor who has a lot of value added services. It turns out that the European model for tech distribution uh, actually has this collapsed model. It goes from manufacturer to what they call value added distributor, VAD, to end customer. So I think CDW is effectively doing that value added distributor move here. And so when, when they talk about the people who get it, uh, it says here on the slide, we estimate that more than 40% of our sales in 2020 in the US came from products and services typically associated with solutions, right? So whereas um, a lot of people are just selling, you know, the box, um, uh, speeds and feeds, that, that's a term that's been used for describing networking equipment, storage equipment, server equipment, they're wrapping it into a solution. Um, and at the low end of the market, they're doing simple things like configuration and setup of servers, storage and networking. But at the, at the higher end, the, the large customer segment, which is about 40% of their business, if I recall correctly, um, they are doing much more sophisticated solutions that then has them being compared with an Accenture and people in that category. So I think, Ian, to your, your point you made earlier, they are compared to uh, a variety of diverse competitors from diverse sectors, um, and they don't they don't fit conveniently into a into a single category. So they they really created this niche for themselves. Their margins um, reflect the gross margins reflect the fact that hardware is very competitive and very commoditized. Um, a lot of a lot of what they're selling, I'm, I'm guessing, when they get in the larger accounts, you're seeing gross margins margins that are in the single digits um, because it's just that competitive. So their movement towards how do we get more software margin as part of the mix? Uh, to your point, Ian, how do we either um, be a provider of SaaS or value added around uh, Amazon Web Service, AWS? That's a big part of their direction. Or how do we sell to the people that are doing that, uh, recognizing where that's going? Um, the, the SaaS stuff is, is taking away revenue on the hardware as well as the software side, right? Because you could be getting outsourced storage, outsourced servers, or you could be getting um, SaaS things that are above the infrastructure lines that have more of a, an application flavor, such as a Salesforce.com or a Microsoft Dynamics. They sell all of these things, by the way. I'm not, I'm not sure if they sell Salesforce, but they sell, you know, they sell the Microsoft Dynamics SaaS solutions, um, as, as part of their entire mix. So I think it's a fascinating company. Um, they were not hit hard by the downturn at all. Um, I'm, if, if you look at the numbers in um, Q2 of the, of the annual 2020, they didn't have that big downturn like a lot of companies did. So they've, they've been, been relatively flat throughout the whole time um, and seem to be positioning for future. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, look, you know, if you look at the numbers on your chart, you know, they have a 120 basis point decline in gross margin percentage. Uh, but, you know, they had a big increase in operating income percentage, right? So that's typically the sign of a good operator, in my experience, right? You're able to adapt to, uh, you know, changing business circumstances and mm -hmm. so, you know, that, and, and, you know, if you look at, it's funny because they talk about how their sweet spot is less than, there's companies with less than 5,000 employees, and that sort of correlates over to their financial results, right? So their corporate category was down 4%, but their small business category was up 12%. And higher ed was up low single digits, but K through 12 was up over 100%. You know, so they... They, you know, healthcare, which is pro they're probably selling through GPOs like everybody else, was down two percent, right? You know, so they uh, they seem to know where they play well, and I, I agree with you. I think that they get compared to a diverse group of competitors. You know, they probably get compared to Arrow and as well as Apple, right? There aren't many companies that are 
compared to companies that to competitors who are so different from each other because Arrow and Apple are wildly different companies with very different business models. So I think it's easy. You know, look, I mean, if you want to find reasons to be dour about CEW's prospects, you can probably find some because you, it depends on who you compare them to. Um, but, you know, I think the that right now the whole world's moving towards a huge in, influx on investment in digital capabilities and becoming ever more automated. And all this technology has relatively short life cycles. So, I, you know, I don't know, I'm not in a position to make an opinion about their current stock valuation, but the long-term prospects for the company seem pretty bright to me. What do you think? They seem nimble, right? And they seem to move with, they seem to evolve with what's happening in the, in the tech world. Um, yeah. So I think that's a, that's a very uh, important attribute of a company to be able to evolve with what's, what's happening in tech. You remember the, the commercials they did a number of years ago, right? Um, yeah. Fred, Fred, you t- tell us about Fred. <laughs> so they did these. This is one of the best, you know, creative campaigns I've ever seen. Uh, and they had this guy named Fred, who was the IT manager. You saw the commercials through his eyes, and people would come up to Fred and say things like, uh, "Hey, Fred, um, I dropped my laptop and now it doesn't work." Or, "Hey, Fred, I fixed my computer but it's still broken." Or, "Hey, Fred, I think I just crashed the internet." And it was sort of this empathy-oriented campaign about how IT managers have this frustrating job where they're constantly fixing things that their users broke themselves. And if you looked at the time, it had some research around like the psychology of IT managers, their number one frustration was people caused their own problems and they had to go fix them. And this campaign really made the point that at CBW, we understand that that's the job that you have and we're here to support you. We are empathetic to your challenges. And CDW's satisfaction among that particular role was off the charts because I think that group felt like, wow, this company really gets what it's like to be me. And although that campaign has been over for a while, which is a shame, I think they ended it long before they should have. Uh, but even though that campaign's been over for a long time, I think that sentiment is still there. If you're an IT manager, you feel like, hey, I, if you're a pro, you buy from CDW because they really get what your job is like. And they're there to get those those products to me as soon as possible to help me fix these problems that end users have created on their own. And even though the IT manager's challenge or the you know CIO's challenge is a lot bigger than just fixing problems that people create for themselves, uh, it really sends this message that we understand what it's like to be you. And I would say it's probably the most well thought out, well executed uh, advertising campaign I've ever seen from a distributor, not just through television, through but through any channel. And if I were the CMO at CDW, I'd be refreshing that campaign through social media and YouTube videos and trying to be viral among IT managers because Man, they just nailed what it's like to have that job. Uh, well, but I think it, even more important, it's like it's like uh, next to the definition of thankless job in the dictionary, picture of an IT yeah, manager, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, and, and I think more importantly than the campaign itself was the capabilities they built behind it. I mean, they really did have that ability to understand your job because they have such well-trained employees. Uh, that the 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 value they delivered was real. I mean, if it, look in B two B, it can't just be about your branding. You really got to live up to it. If you say, "I get what it's like to be you, and I help you solve those problems," in the long run, you really have to do it, or else it doesn't matter. The campaign can't live on its own. I think CDW has done that for years, and as long as they keep investing in these p- positions and in this training. It's right there front and center in their presentations to analysts that that's what they do. Then I think they're, I think it's a very durable point of differentiation, at least to me. So before we, um, before we wrap up, I want to share um, actually just a, a piece about what we are sharing here uh, that we normally would have done at the beginning of this. Um, so the information shared on the Wholesale Change Show 
it is not intended to be a source of advice or financial analysis with respect to the material presented. And the material and the information contained in this website does not constitute investment advice. We are taking uh, information from publicly available sources, including distributor websites, um, investor relations sites, Edgar and, and Yahoo. So that's th those are the sources of our information. Um, you want to you want to wrap up here, Ian? Yeah, look, I think you know there's there are a lot of good companies out there. Um, yeah, I think I think you know there are a lot of good companies out there, right? And these are four well operated companies. The 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 disruption is real. Keep an eye on what's happening with you know companies like Amazon Business and uh, the Home Depot and Lowe's and others. Um, I think if you're a distributor, you need to make sure you're really adding value, you know, sort of copying the CDW formula to the degree that's applicable to you, where uh, you understand not only the specific needs of your customers, but how to talk to them in ways that makes them understand that you get their frustrations and that you can solve them. I mean, you know, ultimately you've got to deliver real value and it's got to be better than value that people can get from competitors. And there are new competitors that you need to strategize against because they're encroaching in your space. Uh, but I think there's still plenty of room for good distributors to grow. Um, I think if, you're, if, you're, if you have some capital in your balance sheet, this is a good time to invest in your own capabilities, in your own people, in your own technologies, in the capabilities you put forward in front of customers, and to make acquisitions. Because you know, for a while now, you know, they say you know, the battle does not necessarily go to the strong or the race to the swift. This is a good time to be strong and swift, though. Uh, because you are going to win most of those battles. Um, and uh, I think scale matters. And, you know, that's why I think M&A is going to continue. So if you've got the capital, you should, you know, make sure you're very well operated and learn, learn how to be a good acquirer. If you feel like you don't have the capital or the desire to compete in the long run, this is a good time to get your balance sheet in shape and, you know, streamline your financials and find a good suitor. Good. And as we look towards our upcoming events, our next show is Wednesday, June 9th, and it's on how private equity firms, how PE firms evaluate distributors. Our special guest is John Schweig, a former colleague of Ian's at Granger, uh, currently the chairman of Blackhawk Industrial and operating partner at Snow Phipps. And so John will be bringing um, the perspective both from the PE side as well as having been on the operating side uh, as, as of being a distributor. We'll be able to share those insights. Week from tomorrow. Yeah, well, is, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, John is one of the brightest people I've ever worked with in distribution. Um, and he really understands strategy. He's modest about it, but he's very, very, very good with strategy. And he really understands how uh, people think in PE. So, now, if you if you have any interest in this topic, I wouldn't miss this session because and and, and send us questions along the way because he's just a, he's an extraordinary person and uh, I worked with him for a, a long time and every time I talk to him I learn something and I think the audience will as well. Those are not faint words of praise. Um, I, I know you think very highly of him, so that promises to be an exciting show. A week from tomorrow, we are continuing our state of in distribution series state of technology and distribution, we're gonna be looking at automating the customer journey. Automating the customer journey, starting with shopping, going to buying, to fulfillment, to invoicing and payment. Um, how close are we? When do we predict that we can get to pretty much a lights out operation in automating the customer journey? You wanna wrap up, Ian? Well, thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next show. And uh, if you have questions, please make sure you reach out by email or by phone and let us know. We'll be happy to help you if we can. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.